So like I said, this program is an example of a lot of kind of things you'll do on a Raspberry Pi where we're plugging into the web on one end and we're kind of plugging into the real world on the other. Uh, so without worrying about what our program does in the center, if we just think about those two ends, to plug into the web, we're using Twitter. Twitter can be browsed, you know, it's just a website, you can browse it in your web browser like this. As it turns out, this is not a good interface for our program to browse Twitter, right? Like we don't want our Twitter, our program to open up a web browser and go searching. So Twitter offers what's called an API, which is just uh, a series of commands essentially that are designed to help programs use Twitter instead of humans. The API we're going to use is called the git search API. So if you go to the if you go to dev.twitter.com, you can find documentation all kinds of stuff like this. There's a bunch of APIs, but this just happens to be a simple one that essentially gives us a way to search Twitter with a program. This uses, it's an HTTP-based API, so this is kind of the protocol that the web runs on top of. All we have to do to use this API is we essentially just have to load a specific web address. So if you look down here, To use this API, all we have to do is make what's called an HTTP GET request. This is actually what your browser does every time you load a website, so there's really no magic here, this is just what it's called. So we just need to make that request to this web address, search.twitter.com slash search.json. Then we're going to pass it some arguments. The Q equals, this is our search parameter, right? So in this case, it's an example here, it's searching for Blue Angels. There's some other parameters, this tells us the max number of results we want it to return and then some other stuff we're not going to use. All we really care about is the max results and the search query. So if we look at something like this, and we're going to do this in our program, but you can actually do it manually if you just take this and drop it into you know, a web browser. So I can do that same towards search I just did, right? So at this Q equals, if I search for, or if I search my own name on Twitter, right, Andy Saylor, and then I actually, in the program, I have the max results set to 100. But if I just run that, it's going to load a page. It's not a web page like humans are used to looking at, but it's a web page full of data that our program can then go and handle. This data is formatted in a format called JSON. If you've used JavaScript, that's what it comes from. Uh, it's just a standardized format for returning a bunch of data about each tweet. What this includes, basically, is it returns an array full of tweets, and in each tweet it includes the tweet itself, the name of the person that tweeted it, what time it was tweeted, a whole bunch of metadata. So we just want to count the number of tweets, so all we basically need to do is take this text, turn it into an actual array, and then count the length of the array, and that's how we know how many tweets we have. So we're going to do this, the Python's going to do this for us, right? We're not going to load it in here, but this is where our data is coming from. We're just asking Twitter for it via this very simple API where we just load a web address with our search query in it. Make sense? There's actually another, when you're testing stuff like this, there's a really uh, handy program that you'll use on the command line a lot if you don't want to do this in a web browser. It's called curl. Curl essentially does everything your web browser does, but it just does it on the command line. So curl-g does a git request. That's the kind of request that loads this data. So if we do a curl-g, and we search for that same thing again, we'll get the same data, only now it's going to spit it out on the command line. So that's just a tool. We don't need it tonight, but there's lots of ways to get a data like this. So that's how we're going to get our data. We're going to use the Twitter API. So the other side is we're going to play a sound. So we could play a sound from directly within Python, but that's actually kind of non-trivial. Instead, we're going to use a program that's built into most Linux installs called Aplay. This is just a very basic sound player. It only knows how to handle waves, so it won't play things like MP3s. You need some other software to do stuff like that. But if you just type in Aplay and then the name of some wave file, so like this, it starts playing it for us. So the two endpoints are kind of handled for us. Twitter will hand us the data if we ask for it. Aplay will play the song if we want it. Now we just have to write the Python that goes in the center and kind of ties this stuff together. Make sense? So this is what Python was designed for. I know people write entire programs in it today, but you know, it's bread and butter used to be stuff like this, just hacking together various other things and connecting them in a manner that made sense. So if we go ahead and take a look at the code. So in a editor of your choice, Emacs is installed, Vim's installed, there's probably like some GUI editors installed too. Uh, Emacs is actually what has a GUI interface if you want to click on things. So whatever editor you want, just do something, open up the code so we can start looking at it. Okay, so I have the code pulled up here. 
Is anyone having trouble knowing how to open code? So I'm going to just kind of take you guys on a walk through what the program does. I'm not going to dive too deep into it because uh, we can always go over it later, but hit the main points so that if you wanted to start hacking with it, you could. Uh, then we're going to let you guys play for a little while and we'll come back and show how we can interface with the Pi-based digital. So at the top here is just a series of comments. That's just me being a good programmer. Then we import a bunch of libraries. So in Python, these are just most of these are in the standard library. These are just loading all the things we're going to need to work with. So sys is how we're printing stuff to the screen. Ard parse, that nice help message you saw at the beginning when I didn't give enough arguments. That's just because I'm using Ard parse. It does all that fanciness for me. Um, time is you've noticed I'm only querying Twitter once every 10 seconds. There's limits on how many times, how quickly you can use the search API. If you hit Twitter, if you ask, if you try to search Twitter like once every tenth of a second, it'll lock you out. So you don't want to hit Twitter too quickly. I'm being kind of conservative and only hitting it once every 10 seconds. The time library is what lets us do that. Subprocess, this is a library that lets us call another program. So this is how we're calling that A play program at the end. Um, these two URL libs, this is how we're actually asking, this is how we're making that web request, right? This is how we're saying, give me this URL and then taking all the data. And then JSON, like I said, that text we're getting is in a specific format. The JSON library will take all of that big string of text and convert it into an actual data structure. So it'll take that string and turn it into like a regular array that we can then work with in Python. So just importing our libraries. I have a series of constants that just control some of the things we have to deal with. So, so things like this uh, timeout, here's where I said this is how often we wait in between making these Twitter calls. So this is where it's set to 10 seconds. Try not to turn this up. I think the network, as far as Twitter sees it, we're all coming from the same IP address. So if everyone in here makes this really fast and gets locked out, they're going to lock out everyone else too, and then no one will like you, and you'll have to work alone. Um, so try to keep this at 10 seconds or above. If you're at your own house and you want to see how fast you can go, I don't care, go for it. But Twitter does place some limits on what you can do with this. Um, I just have some, when the program exits, if it exits with an error, it throws a negative one, zero. That's not really anything to worry about. Here's that API URL. So this is what we got out of the documentation, right? So it's already in the program for you, but if you were writing this from scratch, you would have gone to the Twitter documentation. You would have pulled down this web address. So this is just the base of the web address, and then we just have to stick our arguments onto it. So what we want to query, how many results we want. Um, the Twitter API limits you to 1,000 characters for your query. That's not my limit. If you look on the Twitter docs, it says don't use more than 1,000 characters. So I'm just doing some sanity checking there. Uh, this is the max number of results. We're getting 100. That's the most you can get per page. If you want more than 100 results, you have to make multiple requests. It gets more complicated. So right now our program doesn't work for thresholds above 100. Uh, actually, the thresholds above 99. Um, so just be aware of that limit. Uh, a few other little things you don't have to worry about too much. This is in that JSON. Like I said, it's a big array of tweets. It actually has some data up above the array. And then the array of tweets is named results. So this is saying when you're extracting that array, what you want is the results. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about it. So there's kind of three main parts of the program. There's this count tweets function, which we'll come back to. This is where all of the interfacing with Twitter happens, right? This is, this makes the call to Twitter, it pulls down the results, it counts them, so on and so forth. So it does what it says, you just pass it a query, it searches Twitter, it counts the number of results, it returns an integer. Um, down below that, we set up our arguments. So this is just where I'm telling it, you need to pass a query and account because I'm using this add argument library that prints the nice help messages if you don't know what you're doing. It's a little bit more complicated than it might otherwise be. But all we're doing there is saying it requires two arguments when you run the program. You've got to give us a search query and you've got to tell us what threshold, how many we're waiting for. Mm -hmm. Then we basically start the program. The main body of the program is this while loop. It's just a while loop that keeps running until the number of tweets we're counting is greater than the threshold we've put in. So when I said nine tweets, this kept iterating until it detected nine tweets. It goes into it, it sleeps for 10 seconds, then it actually calls the count tweets, right? So this is where we make sure we're only hitting Twitter every 10 seconds. It calls count tweets, that returns how many are currently on Twitter. Uh, if count tweets encounters an error, like if Twitter goes down or something, this will throw an error at Alexa right here, there's just some error handling. Um, 
if count tweets, once count gets bigger than our threshold, this while loop's gonna exit and we're gonna go down to the next section. But until then, we're just gonna keep spinning in this loop waiting for a number of tweets, right? <coughs> then we have a little bit of status output. This has not, I mean, this just makes it easier for us to follow what's going on on the screen. Here's where I print how many tweets there currently are and then I just say whether or not the alarm will or will not sound using the same test here. This body makes sense? So the program stays here until we get to X number of tweets. It'll stay here forever if you want it to, right? If you never get to those number of tweets. So when we get to those number, that loop exits, and then we actually perform the action. So this is the last part. So you could really do whatever you want here. I'm playing a sound. Um, so my sound, like I said, we're, we're not playing it actually in Python. We're just using Python to call another program. In this place, we're calling the aplay program, just like I did on the terminal, and we're passing it one argument, the name of the file we want to play, so alarm.wave. This is why you have to have a file called alarm.wave. If you don't, it throws that error. If you wanted to call your file something different, you could change it here. If you wanted to make it a third argument, you could put it as a variable, so on and so forth. Um, then basically we play the song. We then have one more while loop. This while loop just waits for this process to finish. So in this case, it's gonna wait for the song to finish playing, and then the program itself is gonna exit. So pretty straightforward. There's a part that counts the tweets. There's a part that just sits and waits until the number of tweets we're counting exceeds the threshold. And then there's the part at the end that does something. And in this case, something is calling the A play program on a file called alarm.wave. Questions on that? So uh, if we just look real quick at what the count tweets function actually does, you don't really have to care, but in case you do, um, the very first thing we do is, so this is the query we pass it. This is Andy Saylor, play some funky music, hashtag, right, whatever. Um, this parse dot quote, you can't use things like, there's certain things you can't use in URLs, like hashtags, spaces, and some other special symbols. So this basically, your query could have spaces in it. You can search Andy space sailor or whatever you want. This is gonna take that and it's gonna replace the spaces with the URL encoded equivalent or replace the symbols. So it's gonna take your spaces and turn them into percent sign 20, you've probably seen stuff like this before. This just takes the human readable query and turns it into the web readable format. Um, after that, it just does a check on the link. Remember our link has to be below a thousand characters. If not, it throws an error. Then we build our URL. So we start with that base URL. Then we add the Q equals. So this is just like we ran on the command line. We put in our query. We add the how many results we want. We put in our 100 from that constant up above. So when we're done with this, we're just gonna have that string that we used on the command line. We're just building it programmatically. Um, then we make our actual request. So this request.url.open, this is the same thing that happens when I paste that into my browser bar and hit go or when I run wget. This is the line that actually goes to Twitter, asks it for all that data. Then there's a little bit of, we have to go through a few steps to take the data Twitter returns and essentially turn it into a format we can use. That's what these three lines deal with. Eventually it decodes it as JSON. So when it returns it, it's just a big string. Actually, it's a set of bytes. We take all those bytes, we turn them into a big string. We take that string and we turn it into a Python data structure that we can actually work with because working with strings is a pain in the ass. So we want it as a data structure. JSON's what let us do that. The final magic what's happened at the end here, we basically take that Python Java structure that we, that we generated from the results, and we say, give me the length of the results. So count the length of the array full of results. That's the number of tweets we have. We then return that value. So not a lot of lines of code here because we're leaning on a lot of Python libraries that are doing kind of all the heavy lifting for us. Why did the projector die? Apparently doesn't like me. Um, well, anyway, that's where I was going to finish talking about the code. So why don't you guys fire it up and play with it for a little while, try to run it, see, make sure it works on your machine. Feel free to go through and start editing it if you want to try to make it do different things. You can change the action. You can have it run any program. You can change what it's asking for on Twitter. If you go to the dev Twitter docs, there's tons of other stuff you can do. Um, but start just by seeing if it plays. If you have a pair of headphones, you can plug them in. I don't know, I need the projector to come back on, but until it does. So you're gonna need a wave file to work with. Um, there's some wave files available for you that you can download uh, from the foundation website. So there's a program called wget that essentially just downloads a file from a web address. So if you do wget, and then this is all gonna be one line, although I'm not gonna write it on one. So if you go to the foundation website, 
.cs.colorado. Should have made a tiny URL for this. <coughs> then if you do slash files, there's two files you can put after this. So one's called alarm clock dot wave, and the other one's called siren dot wave. So if you run wget on either of these, or even if you just paste this into a browser, it should probably download the file for you, but wget lets you do it on the command line. If you download either of these wave files, and then if you rename them, so if you do move whatever, and then you remember right now the file needs to be named alarm.wave. So if you rename these to be alarm.wave and in the same folder as the Twitter alarm clock, you should be able to run it. You can search for whatever tweet you want. Uh, if you run my search query or if you run something that you know has a lot of tweets out there, it'll return right away. If not, you can tweet yourself to trigger it or you can tell me what you need me to tweet to trigger it. Uh, if people don't have headphones, I have one pair up here and then there's also these speakers that people want to play with. So I'll be walking around. We will take, um, take 10, 15 minutes just to play around with this and then we'll go through adding the PyFace Digital to do some other things like flash LEDs and uh, use the buttons to snooze, stuff like that. Questions on any of that? Okay. I borrow the earphones. Uh, yes, I'll bring them over. Um, cool, so play with it. I'll see if I can get my projector to come back on and we'll go from there. Oh, if people try to play sound and can't, so one other caveat here is the Raspberry Pi actually has two sound outputs. It can play sound via HDMI if you have like a TV that has speakers on it, the HDMI will carry the sound. Or it can play sound via the headphone jack. By default, on these monitors, it tries to play via HDMI. Don't ask me why, these monitors don't even have speakers on them. So you're going to need to switch it to use the headphone port. The command to do that is, it's just a single command you can run, it's pretty straightforward. So uh, you're all welcome to run this. Some of you may not need to, depending upon how your gear is set up. It doesn't break anything, but if you run the command a mixer cset numid equals three space one, this is basically saying this is the default output, and then if you put zero, it's auto, one is the headphone jack, or two is HDMI. So if you put one here, we're forcing it to play its sound via the headphone jack, which is what you guys all want in order to test this right now. So if you run this command, You'll get some output like that, and after you run that, you should be good to go. All right, so go at it. I'll be walking around if people have questions or need help. And just to demo wget, if people want to watch it. So if you want to pull down one of those files with wget, So if I run that command, I'll pull it back up again. So it'll download the file. So that was this command here. So it's just what I have written on the board, only more readable. So that downloads this alarm clock.wave file. If I do an ls, we'll now see it in the folder. But recall that unless you change the code in the program, it's looking for a file called alarm.wave. So you're going to need to rename that alarm clock alarm.wave, and then you'll be good to go. All right, have fun.